in the microphone or do I need to turn down my hearing aids? How's it seem to you guys? Is it tolerable? Okay, that's the answer. That's what we needed to hear. Besides, I, uh, <clears throat> I hear myself speak all the time, so it doesn't, doesn't hurt if I turn that volume down a little bit. You know what I'm talking about, don't you, Dick? Yeah. <laughs> These things are a blessing, and yet sometimes it's a little bit of a distraction, too. Hey, it's so nice to be here this Sabbath morning. Um, would you do me a favor? Raise your hand if you're happy that you're here in church today. Okay. Every hand went up, and be sure to let your face know so you can have a little smile on it during these Sabbath hours. I know I've gone around like this an awful lot, you know, beetled brow and face down because I'm so earnest. But uh, we need to remember that we are sharing joy with one another during these times that we, uh, these moments that we spend in worship. Today we're going to look at... Um, Three individuals, these are all Old Testament guys, but that's okay. There's lessons for us to learn everywhere we turn within the Bible. And you'll see the, sermon of the, t uh, the title of the sermon is Man of Valor? Question mark. With that in mind, let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, what a joy it is for us to be here in your presence to know that your desire for us is to learn more of you that we may more fully reflect the change you have made in our life to those around us. Help us to be a witness for you, beginning with those close to us and moving outward, knowing that just as the ripples in a pond don't stop till they break on the shore, so our influence can spread far and wide. Guide us to that end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, all righty, man of valor, let's talk about that. But I want to begin by sharing with you a little adage that I learned a long, long time ago. Uh, and it goes something like this. When in danger, fear or doubt, run in circles, scream and shout. See, that's the way many of us respond when something happens that we hadn't planned for. Oh my goodness, look at this, the sky is falling, the world is coming to an end, and uh, we get into this cycle of fear, and we spiral down, and we fall out of control, and we run in circles, we scream and shout. But that is not the way that we are to live this Christian life. I'd like to have us look at the lives of three men and see if we can pick up some pointers from both the positive aspect of their life and the negative aspect of the lives that we look at. These are not in chronological order. In fact, uh, we're going to kind of do the reverse. Let's start with King Zedekiah. King Zedekiah. Of course, you all remember Zedekiah, don't you? Uh, that's kind of what I thought, too, before I started reading about him. Which one was he? Where did he reign? Who was his dad? How did he come to the throne? All of these kind of questions come to mind, and we can find the answers to these in uh, the second book of Kings, chapter 24, and reading onward from there. Uh, and if you want the background to Zedekiah and his rulership, you can read in uh, chapters 19 through 22 of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapters 19 through 22 are going to give you a whole lot of history and a whole lot of background from God's point of view to what is going on with King Zedekiah. Uh, but let's look here, uh, 2 Kings chapter 24, and I want you to look with me Oh, let's start about uh, verse 17. You see, uh, at this time, Babylon had already taken over Judah, had already triumphed, but uh, had considered this to be one of their vassal states. In other words, you are going to send us all of your resources all of the good folks out of your community, and we're going to leave 
some of the other people behind, uh, and we will determine who is to rule in your country because after all, Babylonian rulers, Nebuchadnezzar said, I'm the guy in charge, I will pick who you have for leaders. And one after another, the people that were appointed to that role um, goofed up. But let's look at this guy. 2 Kings 24, verse 17. Then the king of Babylon made Mathaniah, Jehoiakim's uncle, king in his place and changed his name to Zedekiah. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. We get a little bit of his background here. His mother's name was Hamatel, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. Not the prophet Jeremiah, different Jeremiah. And what do we read about him? He also did evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that Jehoiakim had done, the guy before him. Zedekiah, turns out he was not a very nice guy. And uh, he used the position of king for his own benefit. Uh, listen to what uh, verse 20 tells us. Last verse of chapter 24 says, for because of the anger of the Lord, this happened in Jerusalem and Judah, that he finally cast them out from his presence. Now here's a key point. Then Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. I want to ask you something. Suppose you have seen your country decimated by war. I mean demolished and people taken captive from your country by the winner in the battle, basically they're hostages for your good behavior. Think about that. These people get taken from your country to another country. They're going to be indoctrinated in the Babylonish way of doing things. And if they goof up too badly, or if you goof up too badly, this is pressure either way. The king of Babylon could say, hey, you guys... You better settle down or something bad's going to happen back in Jerusalem. Or vice versa, as they say, the folks in Jerusalem get too carried away and the people that he took to Babylon might suffer as a result of that. But this puppet on the throne rebelled. He didn't like having to answer to um, uh, that guy. What's his name? Somebody help me out here. King of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar. There we go. Woo. Some of this stuff goes away when you're under pressure. So it tells us, chapter 25, verse 1, what happened. It came to pass at a certain time, the king, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, came and laid siege against Jerusalem. Says, you guys have been acting up too long. You've been acting out. I won't put up with it. I'm going to spank you. And... King Zedekiah hunkered down in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was a fortified city. Now, they'd been defeated in the past, but evidently Zedekiah thought this time we'll be able to outlast the, the siege and everything will work fine for us. But that was not the case. They were besieged for almost two years. And finally, as the, as the defenses were breaking down, Zedekiah... Like every king, did he come to the forefront to rally the troops in one great big final battle against Babylon? Are you familiar with the passage? No. He cut and ran. He was a chicken at heart. He didn't want to face the music. It says he fled at night. He went by a gate that he thought nobody knew about. I'll get out of town and it'll, I'll go hide somewhere, and I'll be fine. This is what it says, um, verse 4 of chapter 25, 2 Kings. The city wall was broken through, and all the men of war fled at night. Wow. Doesn't that engender a lot of confidence in the leadership, both political and military, of Judah? No, no, it does not. It says all the... Men of war fled at night by way of the gate between two walls, which was by the king's garden. Uh, they took off and ran. The king went by way of the plain. He says, you guys go that way. I'm going this way. Uh, good luck. Nope, it did not work out. 
The army of the Chaldeans pursued the king, overtook him. All his army was scattered from him. Here he faced trouble. When in danger, fear or doubt, run in circles, scream and shout. And baby, he ran. He took off. He couldn't get away far enough, fast enough. And listen to what went on here. Verse 7. Zedekiah has been captured. Zedekiah has been taken uh, uh, to the king of Babylon at Riblah. They pronounced judgment on him. This is verse 6. And verse 7. This was a tough time, folks. Listen to what happened. Then they killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. And they put out his eyes. And they put him in bronze fetters and took him to Babylon. They've captured the king. They've captured his descendants, the ones that he thought might come to the throne someday. They killed his sons and they blinded him. And they put bronze shackles on him. They took him to Babylon, threw him in prison. Youch! What an experience. Does anybody know right off the top of their head how long Zedekiah was in prison? We're going to find out. I just didn't know if we had any students of Bible history that could tell us right off the top of their head. All right. I didn't remember either. I mean, it's just one of those things you read. And, but let's look. 2 Kings chapter 25, verse 27. Now it came to pass in the 37th year of the captivity of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 27th day of the month, that the king of Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, released the king of Judah from prison. 27 years in captivity. Now do some math with me. 21 years old, he came to the throne, reigned for 11 years, rebelled and was taken captive. So he was 32 when he was sent off to prison. And 37 years later, the king releases him from prison, a new king. Yeah, you know, all is forgiven. All is forgiven. Come on out of prison. He spoke kindly to him. The king of Babylon spoke kindly to him, gave him a more prominent seat, and he ate bread regularly before the king all the days of his life. Wow, isn't that nice? 69 years old, he's let out of prison. But I've got a question for you. Does anything in that passage indicate a change of heart on the part of Zedekiah? Does it say anywhere in there that he turned his face to the Lord? Does it say anywhere in there that he repented or relented of the wicked things he had done through the years? No, not at all. It simply says they let him out of prison. Ooh. His, there's no indication to us that his life was changed by this experience. Oh my goodness. How is that possible? Well, it is possible that we not be changed by the experiences of life. We're not done. We're not done talking about other people. We're going to look at Jehoshaphat. Everybody remember Jehoshaphat? Yeah. He was a good king. We like him. He was a good king. Turn in 2 Chronicles. We're done with 2 Kings. We're going to look in 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 17. And we're going to read about an experience that this king underwent. Uh, there's the, you, if you put a marker in, that always helps. There we are. And it tells us in 2 Chronicles chapter 17, we're going to look at verse, uh, verse um, starting with verse 1. Then Jehoshaphat, his son, reigned in his place and strengthened himself against Israel. There was conflict between the two nations. You remember that after Solomon's time, actually at Solomon's time, there was a division, Solomon's son Rehoboam, there was a division of the kingdom, two tribes and ten tribes, and they were in conflict, both uh, politically uh, and militarily. So there was this conflict. 
that was going on, and Jehoshaphat says, I gotta be strong, and he built up his army, army and he built up his defenses. And uh, verse three tells us, now the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the former ways of his father David. He did not seek the Baals, but sought the God of his father and walked in his commandments and not according to the acts of Israel. So here we have a good king. He feared the Lord, he sought the Lord. Isn't it nice when you turn to the Lord because then nothing bad ever happens in life after that time, does it? It's just smooth sailing from there on out. Has that been your experience as a Christian? You gave your heart to the Lord and everything was just peaches and coconut cream after that? No, no, and it wasn't that way with, with Jehoshaphat either. Now listen, um, we're going to move to verse six. His heart took delight in the ways of the Lord. Verse 13, he sent his leaders to teach. He, in verse eight, he sent Levites with them. Verse nine, they taught in Judah and they had the book of the law of the Lord with them. They went through all the cities of Judah and taught the people. Verse 10, the fear of the Lord fell on all the kingdom. Uh, verse 11, people brought tribute to him that previously they had uh, subjugated in battle. Verse 12, Jehoshaphat became increasingly powerful. Verse 13, he had much property. And there is an enumeration of all that went on there. And we're gonna skip over that. We're gonna come to um, chapter 20. Is that right? Yeah, chapter 20 of Second Chronicles. And it happened after this that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with them besides the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Even though the Lord had been blessing time and time and time and time again, they still had enemies. They still had enemies. Verse two, some came and told Jehosh Jehoshaphat saying, a great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, and they are in Hazazon Tamar, which is in En Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared, let's stop right there. Jehoshaphat feared. Now you remember that little adage, when in danger, fear or doubt, run in circle, scream and shout. That sounds like the way we typically respond. But Jehoshaphat did not. Let's pick it up again there. Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. He knew trouble was coming and his first thought was, I need to turn to the Lord. I need to be with the Lord. I need the Lord to be with me. Uh, chapter 20 of Second Chronicles, verse four. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord and from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. What a wonderful thought. When trouble loomed, they didn't run in circles, scream and shout, no. They came together to seek the Lord. Uh, Jehoshaphat stood up and we see verse six, verse seven, verse eight, verse nine, verse 10, verse 11. He's exhorting the people and praying. Verse 12, O our God, will you not judge them, judge our enemies? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, <clears throat> but our eyes are upon you. They didn't run in circles. They didn't scream and shout. They turned to God for their salvation. And the Lord provided. You can read this. Uh, we're gonna skim over it pretty quickly. It tells us in ver verse 14, the spirit of the Lord fell upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Madaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph. And he said, listen, all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus 
says the Lord to you. Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. How many of you have heard of the great controversy? The great controversy. Show your hands. Have you heard of that, the great controversy? Between who or whom? Who is the conflict, the controversy between? Between Christ and Satan. Yes. What is my role in that battle? that controversy, that war, what role will I play? A I'm a chorister. <laughs> Thank you, brother. He's read this chapter because he knows what's coming, haven't you? Nod your head. Go along with me. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I'm a chorister. I should be singing. I should be singing the praises of God because that's what happens here, folks? We're going to skim through this pretty quickly. It says, uh, you won't need to fight. That's verse 17. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. When you feel insurmountable foes approaching you, turn to the Lord, call to him for help, Stand still and see the Lord because he will fight for you. And uh, <clears throat> verse 18, Jehoshaphat bowed. All the people and inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem bowed and worshiped the Lord. Verse 19, then the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and the children of the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord God in Israel with voices loud and high. You know what they sang? They sang hymn 214 in the church hymnal, we have this hope. I know they did. I'm sure they did. <laughs> or something like that. They sang praises to God. They sang from their hearts. They sang about how the Lord was on their side. Who can be against them? Nobody. And then as they got up the next morning to go out to the place God had told them to go, Jehoshaphat said, listen, listen. Believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. Now, folks, we like to cite that scripture, and I believe it does apply. But let's look at the immediate application. Jehoshaphat was saying, we better believe what this guy told us. We need to show our faith. He promised the Lord would fight for us. We're going to believe what he had to say. When we believe him, we shall be established. And that is how the battle went. They showed up. They stood still and watched. They sang songs, and the bad guys killed one another. Wow. The enemy turned on themselves. When you read down through uh, chapter 20, you see um, verse 27 it says, Judah and Jerusalem went back to Jerusalem with joy, for the Lord had made them rejoice over their enemies. They came, they had musicians in verse 28. Uh, they uh, came to the house of the Lord, verse 29. The fear of God was on all the kingdoms of those countries when they heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. Then the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet, for his God gave him rest all around. All right, let's look quickly here because we're running out of time. Let's look at the influence of lives along the way. Jehoshaphat's influence was a powerful one over the people. He set an example by his life, seeking the Lord. He used his position to ensure that education was taking place. He sent teachers throughout the land to make sure people knew the Lord and had right relationship with God. He was humble enough that when someone stood up in the meeting and said, I've got a message from the Lord, he listened. And when he heard the message, he then complied with the information that God gave. God told him, this is what you're going to do. Jehoshaphat did that. By his leadership, the people were inspired to do the same. The question then would be, what's the influence of my life? Am I, am I like Jehoshaphat? Do I have uh, a kingdom under me? Well, no, we don't have 
tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people dependent on us as their leader. But we all have families in one state or another, those before us, the children and grandchildren who have come after us, those around us, the cousins, the nieces and the nephews. We have influence in that setting. We have communities within which we function, our immediate neighborhood where we live, the people we associate with uh, in our professional uh, affiliations, whatever they might be. What is my influence in those settings? Do I encourage people to turn to the Lord when they are in need of uh, help and leadership, when they are in need of rescue from their enemies? By God's grace, that is uh, the action that we should be taking. Now, in the last few minutes, we're going to run real quickly through the life of a man who was described as a man of valor. Uh, any guesses as to who we're going to talk about? Man of valor. Who do you suppose that might be? You got it. Very first shot. That's terrific. Uh, so let's turn to uh, the book of Judges describing a time in the life of the Israelite people when they had uh, rejected God as their ruler and uh, had not yet reached the point that they wanted a king like the neighbors had. And so judges ruled over the land. We're going to look in Judges chapter 6. And we'll begin reading in verse 11. Judges chapter 6, beginning with verse 11. Now it says... Uh, now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree which was in Orphrah, which belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. Listen to the next line. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Do you think there was a little chuckle in his voice when he said that? I think there was. That's just me reading it. Because here's this mighty man of valor. What's he doing? Threshing out wheat. Where's he doing it? In the wine press. He's hiding. <laughs> He's worried that the enemy will come and steal his food. That's very valiant. What do you think? Do you expect the valiant men of God to hide in the wine press? Okay, maybe I'm reading too much into this. I am, after all, that's just the way I am. You know, sorry about that. I don't see him as a man of valor at this point. It feels like a statement of irony that the angel addresses him as a man of valor. Was he at that moment valorous or valiant. So what did the angel know that Gideon didn't know? Say it louder, because remember I turned down my hearing aids. Potential, yeah, yeah. But it would have been awkward to say, you know, the Lord is with you, you potential mighty man of valor. You mighty man with potential in valor. That would have been... You know, that would have been too weird to talk like that. And so he didn't say that. He called it like he saw it could be. He could be a mighty man of valor. What's so interesting about this is Gideon's response. Gideon's response. You know, he, uh, the angel said, the Lord is with you. And Gideon's response is, hey, if God is with us, how come all of this rotten stuff is happening? What is going on? Uh, we hear stories from the old folks talking about God's leading hand, but we sure don't see it today. Anybody here ever felt that way? We've heard stories about, but I haven't seen it in my day. Ooh. Maybe it's time for us to become Gideons. Let's read on here. Let's press on. Verse 14, the Lord turned to him and said, Go, go. In this might of yours and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? Oh, there's that potential being spoken of. You do have might. I have identified a task for you to do. 
go and do what I have sent you to do. Well, we're familiar. We're familiar with the experience of uh, Gideon, but we may kind of gloss over or ignore a couple of things. The first thing Gideon was tasked with doing was getting rid of a pagan altar. Getting rid of a pagan altar. So do you remember how Gideon did that? He found 10 guys in the household, servants. He says, guys, this is what we're gonna do, but um, dig out your darkest robes and uh, wrap a towel around your face because we're gonna do this at night. We don't want anybody to see us and ruin our effort. And in the middle of the night, they went out and cast down the altar of Baal. Okay, valorous or maybe it was a baby step. Maybe it was a baby step toward being a man of valor. Should we give him credit that way? Because he did what God told him to do. And it doesn't appear that God gave him specifics on how it was to be done. He offered a sacrifice to God. He tore down that, he tore down that altar. But that was just the beginning of uh, Gideon's experience. Chapter 7 tells us that uh, apparently as a result of what Gideon had done, the Midianites and the Amalekites all gathered together. Now, this was not just uh, we're getting together for the state fair or we're getting together for a great big flea market or something of that nature. Chapter 7 makes clear to us that they were, uh, that they were gathered for war. Now, let me find that reference for you here. That would be chapter 7, verses 21, verse 22. Um, no, that isn't either the verse we're looking for. Where did it go? Do, 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 do. <laughs> we're going to ignore that. It's evidently not important enough for me to remember where it is. I don't know. We'll skip right over that. But we will move along to this point. In uh, Judges, 6, verse 30, Judges 6, verses 33 and 34, we have, um, well, it can't be Judges 6, because there is no 33 in that chapter. Oh, yeah, there we go. Open my eyes that I may see. Uh, in verse 33, Gideon's name was he was also referred to as Jerubbaal, which means let Baal plead against him because he's torn down his altar. The Midianites and Amalekites gathered together and they crossed over and camped in the valley of Jezreel and they were gathered for war. We know that because of the rest of the account. 10,000, too many, cut it down, cut it down, wind up with 300 that are going to go and defeat this huge battle. But remember, Gideon, described as a man of valor, had to have not one, but two proofs of God's leadership before he moved forward. He said, Lord, I'm gonna set out a fleece. And then he thought, with the result of that fleece, well, maybe that could have just been a natural uh, phenomenon. And so he says, let's do it the other way around, fleece dry, ground wet. Then after two tests of God's guiding hand, then he said, okay, we'll go forward. And he did do battle. All right. So he was, in fact, a man of valor. So why am I picking on Zedekiah, Jehoshaphat, and Gideon? Well, it's because I think there are lessons that we can learn from them. Um, Zedekiah, let's put it this way, Zedekiah deserved all the bad stuff that fell his way. You know, he was a wicked man. He did wickedly. He rebelled against God and he rebelled against the king who had placed him on the throne. Bad stuff happened to Zedekiah. It's very difficult, very difficult 
to have sorrow or pity for Zedekiah. You have sorrow and pity for the people who suffered as a result of his actions, but Zedekiah himself, it's like, man, you got what was coming to you. You should not have been that way. There were wonderful lessons for us to learn from Jehoshaphat because he showed place God first, turn to God for his guiding for his guidance, for his leading hand. And Gideon, though Gideon was slow to come around, Gideon did ultimately um, accomplish God's plan for him and uh, he became a wonderful leader for the people. But we see Zedekiah hunkering behind walls that couldn't protect him. Jehoshaphat calling on the name of the Lord and the people were rescued as a result of God's leading there. I want to uh, very quickly, we're not gonna spend any time in its discussion because uh, we have run out of it. Um, we're gonna look to Colossians and Ephesians. Colossians 2, Colossians 2 verses one through three. Listen to what uh, Paul writes for our benefit here, Colossians 2, verses 1 through 3. I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Uh, move with me to verse six. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Now he says, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Brothers and sisters, when we are in a pinch, when we see difficulties, uh, evil times coming, when we look for relief, we should first have established our basis with Christ, placed him first in our life, and then been ready for uh, him to respond through us. Now we're gonna close with Ephesians chapter six. It's a passage you know, it's too long to read. Ephesians six, starting at verse 10 and running through verse 20. Does anybody know what this passage talks about? Ephesians six, 10 through 20, what's it talking about? Yeah, put on the whole armor of God. Put on the whole armor of God. We're to study, we're to pray. We should assemble together. We should be prepared to witness and testify for God. And the best way for us to do that is to be fully suited up in Godware. I mean, if you have seen uh, logo shirts, this one says Under Armour. This one says something else. You know, they got logos and brand names on, on uh, garments all over the place. Debbie even sold a bunch of it there at the Campari. You know, it had names printed on it so you knew who you were affiliated with. Well, when we put on the armor of God, there's no question whose side we are on. And so uh, we need to remember Paul's exhortation in Ephesians 6 verse 10 is, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Verse 13, take up the whole armor of God that you may, able, may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Kind of a reference, I think, back to Jehoshaphat. Remember what the people were to do, don't you? They were to stand and see what the Lord would do for them. The battle was not theirs, the battle was the Lord's. Um, Verse 18, pray always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Do you pray for your brothers and sisters in the church? That's what he said to do, isn't it? Pray for one another. Hold one another up before the Lord. We strengthen one another in this manner. 
Well, um, I want to share the last verse there, verse 20. It says, I am an ambassador, Paul was in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Are we bold as we speak about the Lord? Are we brave enough to just say, yeah, no apologies, I'm a Christian on purpose. I'm a Christian through deliberate effort. I've made a decision to follow the Lord. I've given my heart to him. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian because I believe the message preached through this church is a valid one. It's one that speaks to my heart and draws me close to his side. So we may not look valiant in the eyes of the world, but when we stand for God, clad in his armor, we are part of his great army, and he has a place for us, he has a reward for us, and uh, we should follow his leading. Thank you so much for listening to these ramblings. By the way, remember, if you want to learn more about Zedekiah, you can read Jeremiah chapter 19 through Jeremiah chapter 22. Let's have uh, a closing hymn. Closing hymn. Number 590. We'll stand together and sing verse 1, verse 4.